Good morning. I'm Nancy Brown, Chief Executive Officer of the American Heart Association. Welcome to the launch of the new 2020 CPR and Emergency Cardiovascular Care Guidelines. Since the first CPR guidelines were published in 1966, the American Heart Association has consistently reviewed, updated, and published new guidelines to ensure the highest quality care for the people who need it most. We are the first and only United States training organization directly involved in creating resuscitation science and education. Our evidence-based approach to resuscitation is driven by our global volunteer network of science experts who help translate science into guidelines used by all U.S. training organizations. The pandemic has brought many challenges to the forefront, but in true fashion, the American Heart Association has rapidly responded. We are protecting the medical heroes on the front lines, providing oxygenation and ventilation training to help healthcare providers that treat COVID-19 patients, while also offering a hybrid of resuscitation refresher courses. We launched an online adaptive learning course based on the interim guidance for resuscitation of patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19, making the first time an e-learning resource was introduced at the same time as a new guideline. And through RQI partners, we issued We Can Help, a digital resuscitation education crisis response program. No one should be in doubt with the American Heart Association by their side. We have unmatched leadership in resuscitation research, science, and education, and our bold advocacy continues to advance quality care. We were made for this moment, and the results reflect the determination and dedication of volunteers, donors, supporters, and our staff. Today, you'll hear from many scientific experts about the updated guidelines, which not only address health disparities, but also transform opioid-related emergencies and the physical and emotional recovery after cardiac arrest. Together, we will be bold. Together, we will demand change. We will swap challenge for opportunity. Together, we are a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. P Peter Morley and Dr. Nine, Raina eight. Merchant to kick us off this morning. Thank you for joining us. Go. Welcome everyone to the American Heart Association's 2020 Guidelines Virtual Experience. We are so excited to have so many of you joining us today across the US and internationally. As the leader in resuscitation science and education, and the producer of the official CPR and emergency cardiovascular care guidelines, we are proud to present highlights of the 2020 guidelines during our first session of the day. I'm Dr. Raina Merchant, an associate professor of emergency medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and chair of the emergency cardiovascular care committee. And together with Dr. Peter Morley, representing ILCOR, we'll be starting off today's session with an overview of how the official AHA guidelines for CPR and ECC are developed. I'll then turn it over to our colleagues, the chairs and vice chairs of the guidelines writing groups to present 2020 guidelines recommendations for adults, pediatrics, neonates, resuscitation education, and systems of care. Before we get into the detailed highlights, you're probably wondering what's new. Some of the key changes that we'll cover in more detail throughout the session include a new recovery link added to in-hospital and out-of-hospital chains of survival, new recommendations for treating opioid overdose and cardiac arrest in pregnancy, very important updates addressing disparities in CPR training, a reaffirmation of epinephrine, an increased ventilation rate for pediatrics. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Morley. Hi. Um, welcome. The International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation was formed in 1992, and currently its membership consists of the key guideline producing councils throughout the world, including the American Heart Association. Its vision is to save more lives globally through resuscitation 
and its mission is to promote, disseminate, and advocate international implementation of evidence-informed resuscitation and first aid using transparent evaluation and consensus summary of scientific data. UCO has six task forces filled with international volunteers and representing advanced life support, basic life support, education implementation and teams, first aid, pediatric life support, and neonatal life support. ILCOR has published advisory statements and consensus on science statements from 1997, then every five years from 2000 through to 2020 that published today. I have the privilege of sitting on the ILCOR board and the honor to chair ILCOR's scientific advisory committee. The ILCOR task forces create consensus on science statements with treatment recommendations. And this science and recommendations are used by the guideline rating organizations, such as the American Heart Association, to produce their detailed resuscitation guidelines. This process moves from right to left. It starts with a topic, which is formulated into an answerable question, and then a detailed review of the scientific evidence is conducted. The studies identified by the review are catalogued, the process to produce the 2020 CoStar evaluated hundreds of thousands of studies. In this way, a detailed reference list is created. The information from the studies identified by this review is then carefully analyzed and combined using a standardized approach. The overall evidence evaluation process follows a detailed methodological structure. The reviews are based on the methodological principles published by the National Academy of Health and Medicine, the Cochrane Library, GRADE, and reporting guidelines based on the recommendations from PRISMA. Three main categories of evidence evaluation were conducted for the 2020 guidelines. The first is the traditional methodologically rigorous systematic review process, predominantly for questions regarding interventions, but also regarding diagnostic tests and prognosis. The consensus on science statements and treatment recommendations are all based on systematic reviews. The second is scoping review. And this was used when a broad question was asked to explore what literature is actually available and to establish whether a systematic review should actually be conducted. The final review type was the evidence update. For these reviews, an international expert conducted a limited search of a particular literature and summarise their findings, again establishing whether or not a formal systematic review should be conducted. Many of the systematic review and scoping reviews have now been published in the peer-reviewed literature, and the key components of the three types of reviews are included in the detailed ILCOR consensus on science and treatment recommendations and appendices that are published today. The information from these 83 systematic reviews, 31 scoping reviews, and 71 evidence updates forms the scientific foundation from which resuscitation guidelines are created around the world. Back to you, Rona. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the overview. This figure illustrates the process of how a research question from the AHA communities moves through several steps to ILCOR and AHA writing groups to eventually become a guideline. The recommendations are then assigned a class to delineate the strength of the recommendation and then a level to delineate the quality of evidence. Ultimately, the guidelines are meant to identify clinical efficacy, help with ease of implementation, and take into account local systems factors to support adoption. The AHA translates the guidelines into resuscitation education and training to ensure that students receive the highest quality knowledge and skills. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Ash Panchal to provide highlights from the adult section. Thank you, Raina. I'm Ash Panchal and I'm joined by Dr. Kate Berg today. Our writing group is excited for the release of the updated adult AHA guidelines and to showcase all the hard work of the whole committee. The 2020 adult AHA guidelines are directed at, a, at providing you a comprehensive look at cardiac arrest care. 
Our work spanned the full spectrum of the chain of survival, including bystander interventions, pre-hospital management, and cardiac arrest care in both the ED and the in-hospital setting, both before and after ROSC. In these guidelines, following a rigorous evidence evaluation, we present 250 new and updated guidelines. The total to top 10 take home messages of the adult section does a good job of describing the overall highlights of the updated guidelines. One of the most exciting aspects of the comprehensive evaluation was that once again, we were able to reaffirm the key aspects of resuscitation. These include the importance of bystander recognition, early high quality CPR, and early defibrillation for shockable rhythms. This is mirrored in our BLS and ALS adult cardiac arrest algorithms. In the BLS algorithm, you see the focus of early recognition and CPR initiation with early defibrillation. So here you see early recognition at the top and of course, the use of CPR and, and early defibrillation. In advanced life support, in addition to these cornerstones of resuscitation, we reaffirm the importance of epinephrine for cardiac arrest. Due to data from a recent large randomized trial showing improved survival with epinephrine, particularly for those with non-shockable rhythms, we emphasize the importance of early epinephrine for these patients. And in the updated ALS algorithm, we have given some visual cue to prompt the, the importance of giving epinephrine as soon as possible, specifically for patients with non-shockable rhythm. One important issue in resuscitation is that all cardiac arrest events are not identical. To have optimal patient outcome, many situations require specialized management depending on the, on the event itself. In these guidelines, we present a number of special circumstances with recommendations for resuscitation. As an example, we present new algorithms for the management of cardiac arrest in pregnancy and opiate-associated cardiac arrest. Concerning cardiac arrest in pregnancy, we highlight the importance of team planning to optimize outcomes during maternal arrest. Additionally, we also stress the importance of ladder and uterine displacement and perimortem delivery. Concerning opiate-associated cardiac arrest, we recognize the large burden of disease from the opiate epidemic and the increased rates of cardiac arrest. Therefore, in this guideline, we feature an in-depth evaluation of the literature on opiate-associated cardiac arrest. We present new algorithms which leverage the rigorous evidence evaluation of a new scientific statement on opiate-associated cardiac arrest. For patients who achieve return of spontaneous circulation, it's increasingly understood that optimizing post-ROS care has a significant impact on functional outcome. In recognition of this importance, we present an updated algorithm for post-ROS care that describes both the initial stabilization um, as well as important aspects of critical care interventions in the, in the few days after cardiac arrest. And these include targeted temperature management, EEG monitoring, imaging and blood pressure management, among others, to assure optimal patient outcome. And then a particularly important part of post-ROS care is neuroprognostication. Um, and in, in these guidelines, we feature a detailed evaluation of the updated evidence of neuro on neuroprognostication based on multiple very exhaustive systematic reviews done by ILCOR. Um, and due to the importance of both timing and a multimodal approach for neuroprognostication, we've created a new schematic to guide providers that provides an overview of the key components of prognostication, including imaging, electrophysiology, physical exam, and biomarkers, as well as guidance on timing for optimal prognostication. Finally, and possibly one of the most important changes is the recognition of recovery as a key aspect of the chain of survival. We have worked diligently to improve outcomes, and now we need to focus on the care of our survivors. In this guideline, we leverage a new scientific statement on survivorship and recognize that recovery is a process that requires organized planning to optimize a patient's outcome as they transition home, making recovery a key aspect of our everyday care. Hopefully this discussion provided a small idea of the comprehensive nature of the 2020 adult guidelines. 
we are excited to bring these guidelines forward and to continue to improve outcomes in our community. We'd now like to welcome Alexis Topchin and Tia Raymond to the virtual stage to present updates for pediatric resuscitation. Thanks, Ash. Tia and I, on behalf of the AHA Pediatric Writing Group, are thrilled to talk about the key updates and highlights from the AHA 2020 Pediatric Basic and Advanced Life Support Guidelines. We will focus on CPR, airway management, and post-arrest care. While no specific changes were made to the recommendations regarding the performance of chest compressions in the 2020 guidelines, we continue to highlight and emphasize the critical importance of high quality CPR with a focus on providing adequate compression rate and depth, minimizing interruptions, and allowing for full chest recoil. For pediatric patients in any setting, it is reasonable to administer the initial dose of epinephrine within five minutes from the start of chest compressions. This is a change from the prior guidelines, which did not specifically state a time frame. Studies of pediatric in-hospital cardiac arrest have demonstrated that children who receive epinephrine for an initial non-shockable rhythm demonstrated that for every minute delay in administration of epinephrine, there was a significant decrease in ROSC, survival at 24 hours, survival to discharge, and survival with favorable neurologic outcome. Studies of pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest demonstrated that earlier epinephrine administration increased rates of ROSC, survival to ICU admission, survival to discharge, and 30-day survival. The opioid epidemic has not spared children. These guidelines contain new recommendations for the management of children with respiratory or cardiac arrest from opioid overdose. These are extrapolated from the adult guidelines as no specific pediatric data were reviewed. For children in respiratory arrest, standard pediatric basic or advanced life support measures should be implemented. In addition, it is reasonable for responders to administer intramuscular or intranasal naloxone. For children in cardiac arrest, even if opioid overdose is suspected, the focus should be on high quality CPR with compressions and ventilations and should take place in the administration of naloxone. When performing CPR in infants and children with an advanced airway, it may be reasonable to target a respiratory rate range of one breath every two to three seconds or 20 to 30 breaths per minute, accounting for age and clinical condition. Rates exceeding these recommendations may compromise hemodynamics. This is a change from the previous guidelines, which recommended for the intubated child a ventilation rate of about one breath every six seconds or 10 times per minute without interrupting chest compressions. New data suggests that higher ventilation rates, at least 30 breaths per minute in infants less than one year of age and at least 25 breaths per minute in older children are associated with improved rates of return of spontaneous circulation and survival in pediatric in-hospital cardiac arrest. For infants and children, it is reasonable of one breath every two to three seconds or 20 to 30 breaths per minute. This is a change from the prior guidelines, which recommended giving rescue breaths at a rate of about 12 breaths per minute. Although there are no data about the ideal ventilation rate for children in respiratory arrest with or without an advanced airway, for simplicity training, the respiratory arrest recommendation was standardized for all situations. Do not underestimate bag mask ventilation. For out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, bag mask ventilation results in the same resuscitation outcomes as advanced airway interventions, such as an endotracheal intubation. Previous guidelines recommended either a cuffed or uncuffed endotracheal tube for intubation in infants and children. In this update, we now recommend cuffed endotracheal tubes over uncuffed endotracheal tubes for intubating infants and children with attention to tube size, position, and cuff inflation pressure. Data support that when cuffed tubes are used, there's a decreased need for tube changes and reintubation. 
And of note, subglottic stenosis is rare. For the 2020 guidelines, the routine use of cricoid pressure is not recommended during endotracheal intubation of pediatric patients. This update is supported by new data that the routine use of cricoid pressure reduces intubation success rates and does not reduce the rates of regurgitation. The pediatric tachycardia with a pulse algorithm does not include the words poor perfusion in the title as prior guidelines has stated. Rather, the algorithm is now for all tachycardia with a pulse and the assessment of whether the patient has cardiopulmonary compromise signified by altered mental status, signs of shock or hypoperfusion is now immediately assessed after the initial assessment and support of the airway and presence of a pulse is confirmed. After the rhythm is assessed by a 12 lead ECG or monitor, rather than focusing first on whether the rhythm is wide or narrow, the focus is now on the clinical status of the patient and whether they have cardiopulmonary compromise. Based on whether the patient does or does not have cardiopulmonary compromise, the duration of the QRS is then identified to help decipher supraventricular tachycardia from ventricular tachycardia and further treatment. The resuscitation is not over with return of spontaneous circulation. For all patients, we should prevent and treat hypotension, hypercapnia, hypocapnia, hyperoxia, and hypoxia. For children who do not regain consciousness following in or out of hospital cardiac arrest, we recommend using either targeted temperature management, TTM, to 32 or 34, followed by 36 to 37.5 degrees Celsius, or TTM of 36 to 37.5 degrees Celsius. Seizures, including non-convulsive status epilepticus, are common after cardiac arrest and cannot be detected without EEG. When resources are available, continuous EEG monitoring is recommended for the detection of seizures in patients with persisting encephalopathy after cardiac arrest. Both convulsive and non-convulsive status epilepticus are associated with poor outcome, and treatment of status epilepticus is beneficial in a general pediatric population. It is now recommended to treat clinical seizures in children following cardiac arrest, as well as to treat non-convulsive status epilepticus following cardiac arrest in consultation with experts. Finally, prognosis for patients who receive therapeutic hypothermia should be delayed until 72 hours after rewarming to increase the likelihood of accuracy. For 2020, we have now created a post-cardiac arrest care checklist in order to provide clinicians with an accessible approach on how to care for the child following cardiac arrest. To highlight these different aspects of cardiac arrest management, the pediatric chain of survival has been updated. A separate out-of-hospital chain of survival has been created to distinguish the differences between out-of-hospital and in-hospital cardiac arrest. In both the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and in-hospital cardiac arrest change, chains, a sixth link has been added to stress the importance of recovery, which focuses on short and long-term treatment evaluation and support for survivors and their families. It is recommended that pediatric cardiac arrest survivors be evaluated for rehabilitation services. It is reasonable to refer pediatric cardiac arrest survivors for ongoing neurologic evaluation for at least the first year after cardiac arrest. There is growing recognition that after cardiac arrest, survivors can have physical, cognitive, and emotional challenges and may need ongoing therapies and interventions. Survivors of cardiac arrest may require ongoing integrated medical, rehabilitative, caregiver, and community support in the months to years after their cardiac arrest. Next up, to discuss the updates for neonatal resuscitation, we're pleased to introduce Drs. Khalid Aziz and Henry Lee. Thanks, Chair. Hello. Hello, I'm Henry Lee, Associate Professor of uh, Pediatrics and Neonatology at Stanford University. And with my colleague, Dr. Khaled Aziz, we're happy to present the work of the AHA Writing Group for the Neonatal Guidelines. Uh, 
The 2020 neonatal resuscitation guidelines follow the steps of the neonatal resuscitation algorithm, which is unchanged from 2015. The algorithm starts with the needs of every newly born baby and proceeds to address the needs of babies who are at risk for or have cardiorespiratory compromise. Approximately 10% of newborns need help with breathing at birth. To address this, clinical, need, clinical teams need to anticipate the need for resuscitation while training and preparing appropriately. Every birth should be attended by at least one trained individual dedicated to the immediate care of the newborn with arrangements for immediate assistance from others. We reaffirm that most newly born infants do not require immediate cord clamping or resuscitation after birth. Healthy newborn infants can be evaluated and monitored while enjoying skin-to-skin -skin contact with their mothers after birth. Skin-to-skin -skin care promotes healthy outcomes such as normothermia, parental bonding, and breastfeeding. Inflation and ventilation of the lungs remains a priority for caregivers providing immediate neonatal care. In regard to babies who are born, born through a meconium stained amniotic fluid, clinical trials suggest that the presence of meconium stained amniotic fluid does not change the priorities of immediate neonatal care. After birth, perform the initial steps by providing warmth and positioning the baby, stimulate and clear visible secretions if required, and if respiratory support is indicated, provide effective uh, positive pressure ventilation, and then perform corrective steps as necessary. Direct laryngoscopy and endotracheal suctioning are only required if obstruction is evident. Pass it on to Dr. Aziz. A rise in heart rate remains the most important indicator of effectiveness of ventilatory support and of response to your interventions. More data emerge suggesting that electrocardiography is the most reliable way to detect a heart rate and is therefore preferable as resuscitation interventions proceed or advance. Pulse oximetry is used to guide oxygen therapy and meet oxygen saturation goals. The indications for chest compressions remain the same in 2020, based on poor response to ventilation with appropriate connect corrective measures. The rate of chest compressions remains 90 per minute, synchronized with 30 lung inflations per minute. The umbilical venous route is the preferred method for epinephrine and volume administration. Outside the delivery rooms, Practitioners may be more comfortable with intraosseous access, and this is a reasonable alternative. Evidence suggests that survival is unlikely if during resuscitation, heart rate remains unrecordable after more than 20 minutes of continued resuscitation. It is recommended that this approximate time frame be used to initiate discussions with the care team and family regarding cessation of resuscitative efforts. We recognize that many of our recommendations mirror those from previous years. Through an extensive process of reviewing ILCOR statements, including systematic scoping and evidence reviews, we have reappraised past and present evidence to refine our guidelines. Some recommendations are stronger or better supported. We have also made suggestions where evidence is weak and further research is required and encouraged. We have identified many gaps in our current knowledge, including team composition and training, devices used during resuscitation, special newborn populations, such as extremely preterm babies and those with congenital cardiac or respiratory anomalies. Our next presentation Focusing on updates to resuscitation education will be led by our colleagues, Adam Cheng and Aaron Donahue. Thanks, Khalid. 
Uh, Aaron and I are pleased to present the education science portion of the 2020 AHA guidelines on behalf of our writing group. In 2013, ILCOR published the formula for survival, which described three key components contributing to survival outcomes from cardiac arrest. In these guidelines, we describe evidence supporting the importance of educational efficiency by highlighting topics related to instructional design and individual provider considerations. Instructional design features are the key ingredients of education. They determine how educational programs are designed and delivered. The 2020 guidelines review the evidence for 10 different instructional design features, one specialty topic, and an additional four topics related to provider characteristics and access to education. First, let's discuss four instructional design features that, when implemented, have proven benefits for enhancing resuscitation skill acquisition. Deliberate practice is a training approach where learners are given a discrete goal to achieve, immediate feedback on their performance, and ample time for repetition to improve performance. Mastery learning builds on deliberate practice by including testing that includes a set of criteria to define a specific passing standard. Our review of the literature showed that the majority of studies using these approaches improve learner performance during simulated resuscitation. We recommend incorporating deliberate practice and mastery learning into basic and advanced life support courses with a focus on providing learners sufficient opportunity for deliberate practice and ample time to attain the minimum passing standard required for a specific skill. Currently, most resuscitation courses use a mass learning approach, a single training event lasting hours or days with retraining every one to two years. Booster training is another instructional design feature involving brief weekly or monthly sessions focused on repetition of content that was initially presented during the mass learning course. Frequent booster training at intervals of one to six months is associated with improved long-term retention of CPR skills. In these guidelines, we make a class one recommendation to implement booster sessions when utilizing mass learning approach for resuscitation training. A space learning approach involves the separation of course content into multiple training sessions, each lasting minutes to hours, which inter with intervals of weeks to months in between sessions. Space learning courses are of equal or greater effectiveness than mass learning courses for pediatric resuscitation training. More research is required to compare space learning with mass learning for advanced life support, neonatal and basic life support. Given the evidence that we have in pediatrics, we believe it is reasonable to use a space learning approach in place of a mass learning approach for resuscitation training. CPR feedback devices provide objective feedback on CPR performance during practice. Corrective feedback devices provide a visual display or auditory prompting for CPR quality relative to desired targets. This allows the learner to adjust their compression depth rate and recoil to meet AHA guidelines. The use of corrective CPR feedback devices during training results in improved skill performance at the end of training and up to three months later. As a majority of studies demonstrate positive effects of CPR feedback devices during training, we've made a class 2A recommendation for the use of these devices during training. The next several recommendations will deal with how to enhance resuscitation training and afterwards how to enhance training in CPR for lay people. Um, the use of teamwork training has been a part of AHA courses for more than 10 years and it's based on the recognition that such things as leadership, communication, and role clarity uh, enhance the way teams work and their performance in resuscitation exercises. Uh, based on our review of the literature, we make a two-way recommendation that specific teamwork training uh, be a part of life support courses in that it can yield better learning outcomes among learners who receive it. The term mannequin fidelity is used to refer to the physical features that are appreciable from mannequins and from simulators that are used in training courses. Uh, these mannequins have come to exist across the age range and in a variety of other pathophysiologic states over the past several decades. 
Um, we balance these recommendations with the recognition that using them properly requires trained personnel as well as costs. But we recommend with 2A and 2B classes that mannequins with higher fidelity can be used to enhance training and in their absence that lower fidelity mannequins can be used and it's reasonable to use them for enhancing resuscitation training. In C2 training refers to learners who undergo resuscitation training in their native clinical environments as opposed to in a classroom or in a simulation laboratory. Uh, the theoretical benefits are enhanced realism and enhanced uh, contextual pertinence to trainees when they're undergoing these sessions. We can make a class 2A recommendation that the use of in situ training as a supplement to standard training may be beneficial, and a 2B recommendation that in situ training could replace classroom based training for resuscitation education. Lastly, gamified learning refers to the use of such things as competitive leaderboards when using resuscitation training assessments. And virtual reality refers to the use of immersive 3D environments to enhance reality during resuscitation training. These are relatively new fields in resuscitation education, but a review of the literature uh, leads us to make 2D recommendations that the use of gamified learning and or virtual reality may be considered for basic and advanced life support to enhance learner outcomes. The next few recommendations I'll go over have to do with CPR training in the lay population. And it's important to note that this set of recommendations all, all carry class one, the strongest ones that we provide based on the realization that um, for all of these recommendations, the benefit far outweighs the risks. Firstly, with regard to lay training, we recognize that self-directed CPR training overcomes obstacles in terms of ease of use and cost. And we make a class one recommendation that self-directed CPR training be used in addition to standardized training for lay person learners. And it may be a reasonable replacement uh, for traditional classroom or instructor guided learning. The second one has to do with the training of young people as future community-based lay rescuers. We know from studies that children as young as 10 or 11 years old can provide effective chest compressions to adult mannequins. And we have give a class one recommendation that all students in middle and high school undergo training to provide high quality CPR in the hopes that this will lead to a broader pool of uh, bystander CPR providers in the community. And then finally, we are increase, increasingly recognizing that CPR training, CPR readiness, and the prevalence of bystander CPR varies um, from uh, areas in our society related to ethnicity, race, so socioeconomic status, and even gender. And we strongly recommend that targeted training be provided to neighborhoods or communities based on race or based on ethnicity to target higher risk or more underserved populations. And additionally, we recommend that it is reasonable to address barriers to bystander CPR for female cardiac arrest victims through the use of educational training and public awareness efforts. Thanks, Aaron. In developing these guidelines for resuscitation education, we've identified several key opportunities to help advance our field moving forward. These include defining and standardizing outcomes of clinical relevance, establishing links between performance outcomes in training and patient outcomes, both of which will help us to solidify the importance of effective resuscitation training for patient survival. More research is required to establish the cost effectiveness of various different training interventions. And we see a pressing need for research describing how to tailor certain instructional design features to key resuscitation skills. And we view these guidelines as a roadmap and we encourage resuscitation educators to review the recommendations and reflect on opportunities within their own training programs to enhance educational efficiency. For our final science update, we welcome our colleague Kate Berg to cover updates for systems of care. Thank you, Adam. So the systems of care working group, I think is a little distinct from some of the others and that it includes input from all of the other working groups. So represented by each working group, writing group, sorry. And also that rather than looking at the benefit of a specific intervention at the individual patient level, it really looks at the most efficient way to deliver the interventions that we know are beneficial to as many patients as possible. So just a brief 
overview of our top 10 take home, some of which I'll go into a little more detail on. First, we do talk about the important new recovery link, and I know that's been addressed earlier in this session. We have several recommendations looking at various ways to improve the or increase the percentage of cardiac arrest vi victims who receive layperson uh, CPR or lay rescuer CPR. We look at the importance of early warning systems and ways to detect patients at risk for having a cardiac arrest in the hospital. And then we look at a couple of ways of using our own data to improve our outcomes. So both at the individual resuscitation event level with using debriefing and with participation in cardiac arrest registries. We look at the cognitive aid data for resuscitation, both for lay rescuers and for healthcare providers. And finally, review the evidence for cardiac arrest centers, the benefit of which seems logical, but remains unproven really. So when I think of the evidence for improving the number of patients who get lay rescuer CPR, I break it down into interventions before the arrest happens and then during the arrest itself. So before the arrest happens, we have recommendations around um, ways to improve the number of people in the community who are sort of primed and ready and trained to perform CPR and say that it may be reasonable for communities to implement multiple strategies for increasing both awareness of cardiac arrest and delivery of bystander CPR. And this is through both uh, in-person training events, instructor-led training, including mass training events, mass media campaigns, campaigns and self-directed learning as, as was highlighted in the previous section. And then we also have a strong recommendation for public access to fibrillation programs, particularly in, in communities that are at increased risk for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. For during an arrest event, uh, we review the data for telecommunicators and telecommunicator CPR instructions. And multiple studies have shown that when a telecommunicator, otherwise referred to as dispatch, um, instructs a lay rescuer who calls 911 and how to recognize cardiac arrest and initiate CPR, that the number of patients who receive lay rescuer CPR goes up. These studies have not really conclusively shown better outcomes, but do, as we all recognize the incredible importance of lay rescuer CPR, I think this is a strong recommendation. And one of the mnemonics that we highlight for telecommunicators to use when, um, when working with a caller is the no, no, go mnemonic. So is a patient, are they conscious? No. Are they breathing normally? No. Then go ahead and start CPR. And then when you have people who are trained but want to get the right person to the right place at the right time, people have increasingly with the ubiquitous nature of cell phones have started using mobile app technology to alert lay rescuers to the presence of a cardiac arrest victim and their location as well as the location of the closest AED. So these programs alert people who subscribe to the app to a cardiac arrest in their area and tell them where it is and how to get the closest AED. There have been a couple of trials done primarily in Europe and in urban centers that have shown that these programs can get people to receive CPR quicker and also to earlier defibrillation. These studies have not yet shown a true survival benefit, but I think it's promising data. Um, and it remains to be seen whether these apps will be as useful in less urban settings or in other countries as well. And then I think there's not enough data yet to provide a recommendation, but there are some more novel technologies such as using drones to get AEDs to more remote, remote locations that I think are promising for the future. And we've identified that as the knowledge gap. We did review the evidence on cognitive aid in resuscitation, both for lay rescuers and for healthcare providers. And the data on for lay rescuers is somewhat mixed in that it seems that cognitive aids do help people adhere to the proper steps of CPR as they go through it, but that using such an aid might actually delay the start of CPR. Um, and for that reason, we've said that the effectiveness is a little unclear and deserves further study before widely implemented. And then for healthcare providers, this is also somewhat of a knowledge gap in the cardiac arrest resuscitation field. So really isn't a lot of data specifically for cardiac arrest resuscitation. So we've extrapolated that it may be reasonable to use such cognitive aids based on the trauma literature that has looked at this, but also somewhat of a knowledge gap. And then debriefing, I think, is increasingly recognized as, as important. So multiple studies have shown that debriefing after resuscitation events um, can help improve metrics and include improve team performance going forward. And one thing I particularly wanted to highlight is it seems that an important component of debriefing is to use objective data. So not just the, you know, the subjective experience and what people noticed who were at the event, but also incorporating data from a defibrillator on chest compression depth and rate and whether everything was on target can be especially helpful. 
And then another way in which using our own data can help us improve outcomes over time is participation in cardiac arrest registries. And so studies do suggest that centers that participate in registries and enter their own data and look at that data peri periodically, looking at benchmarks of resuscitation, tend to see improved outcomes over time. So we've said that it's reasonable for organizations uh, to do this kind of process of care uh, evaluation. So with that, I'll conclude this section and systems of care concludes our first session of the guidelines virtual experience. The um, behalf of my colleagues and all of American Heart Association, we'd like to thank you all for attending and joining us today to hear about these updates for the 2020 AHA guidelines for CPR and emergency cardiovascular care. For more information, you can go to this website, eccguidelines.heart.org um, and to access the full guidelines. And then finally, we wanna take this opportunity to encourage you all to register and attend for the American Heart Association's first ever virtual scientific sessions and resuscitation science symposium and annual meeting coming up in November. Um, this, this event will include not only more presentations on the guidelines, but also multiple sessions celebrating basic clinical and epidemiologic science in cardiovascular and resuscitation medicine. Thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you there.